Good afternoon, everyone. We're here today with Tom Campbell, Farbot Koshnud, and David Chartrand. Farbot is the team leader conducting Tom's physics experiments, which are variations of the double slit experiment, with David Chartrand as research assistant. Farbot, thanks for being here, and please tell us what the current status of the experiments are. Thank you very much, Tona, for the introduction. I would like to share with you uh, some of the work that we have been trying to do. We have started to do the double slit experiment in combination with the quantum entanglement. We have some initial results for our interference data. This is some sort of interference, but we think that we have to improve it. Uh, this is, uh, we have to improve it so we get a better clear interference pattern. And uh, one thing we have noticed that we have to do is if I share with you another uh, screen is if you look at our experiment, this is our experimental setup that we have some, um, some collimators, some filters, and the, the, the beams of the uh, photons are coming from the bottom and reaching to the, uh, to the, to the polarizing beam splitters, these two polarizing beam splitters, and then it can go to A, A prime, and B, B prime, depending on the polarization of the photons. If they are horizontal, they transmit and go to A and B. And if they are vertical polarizations, they, they reflect and go to A prime and B prime. So one of the things that we recently noticed is that here uh, in front of each uh, collimator, by the way, the collimators are on now uh, uh, connected by the fiber cables to our single photon, four channel single photon counter, uh, which is also connected to an FPGA and then give us the result of the single counts and the coincidences uh, using a lab view software. So what we noticed is that the, the, we are not getting as much as good uh, data, as much as data that we are expecting. And when I talk to other colleagues who are expecting experts in quantum physics, we noticed that initially, I, I, I used to have a different type of a filter. And then I, I thought maybe it's, it's a good idea to get a, a very small bandwidth filters, which we have here now is 10 nanometer bandwidth filters to increase the accuracy. So we only collect the data that we are looking for, for the 810 nanometer photon uh, wavelengths that we are receiving from the BBO crystal. But that actually can cause a problem after we I talked to the colleagues because uh, the laser bandwidth, uh, the input of the laser can vary slightly from um, what we are expecting, which is 405 nanometer to maybe up to 409 and as, uh, as low as 402 nanometer bandwidth, and that can cause a problem because that slight variation, then by doubling that, because it's going through the BBO crystal, that bandwidth will, uh, that wavelength will double to 810. That's why we have 810 nanometer filter. So then 10 meter, like we are basically, we are allowing only to 815 or maybe 805 only to pass because of the 10 nanometer uh, uh, bandwidth we have here, but that may actually, because of the slight difference in the in the in the, in the pump laser, really that can block everything else which we we are actually we, we we are expecting to receive. So that is an issue. I already have two of these uh, three, thirty nanometer uh, bandwidth filter which we, I can replace them. That's not a problem, but I still need to get two more or at least one more because we are expecting only to have A prime A and B. We don't need really B prime. That's an extra uh, detector. Uh, in our double slit experiment, we only need A prime A, B, basically three of them. So the fourth one is, is only for quantum entanglement experiment uh, that we have here, not for the double slit experiment. So therefore, uh, so, this is the type of result we are usually getting from our uh, entanglement, quantum entanglement. So for example, we say, this is the number of single photons we get in a half a second, for example, 6,000, 6,000. And 
the coincidences in half a second is about five coincidences. So those numbers are low. And the reason they are low, we realize that that is because we are using 10 nanometer filters and we have to change that to a 30 nanometer filter. We also have to make sure that we measure the wavelength of our laser uh, to make sure what is exactly it is. So we are going to get a different device also. And uh, so basically to make sure that we measure the wavelength of the laser pump. And so actually we, we know what we are expecting to, to get. So therefore we are, when once we change that, we are expecting to get a much larger number of uh, coincidences and single counts. When we do that, then we are expecting to, when we go back to, sorry, I'm sharing now. When we go back to do the double, double slit experiment, we, we expect to get a better pattern. here. So by the way, each point that we are collecting here, basically what, what this means is that we are moving our, one of the detectors, let's say the detectors that I showed you uh, here. So what this data means is that we are moving this detector, one of the detectors, in front of, uh, uh, in, in, like in this direction, as I show you by, by moving my mouse. And then that basically for each position, we are collecting data, how many uh, coincidences between uh, B we get and uh, either A or A prime. And that indicates one of these points. And for each point, we are collecting data something in the range of maybe 20, 40 seconds for now, but we are going to increase that to a longer time. So to collect longer time data. So once we collect all this data, then uh, we know how many coincidences we get, for example, in 20 seconds or 40 seconds. And then we, we move that to a next position slightly. Each position is about 10th of a, nano, uh, tenth of a uh, millimeter. So we move it to the next position, collect data, move it to the next position, collect data. And once we move, uh, basically is, uh, we move uh, about uh, all the distance or uh, the displacement of about, uh, about uh, one centimeter, one and maybe one centimeter, we collect all this data. And then we are expecting to get that interference pattern that we want. And then the next step would be putting uh, other uh, polarizers in front of the double slit. And of course, then we are expecting to get uh, uh, no interference and all those uh, continuation of the, the data collection that we are expecting to do and we have to do. Okay, so just an, a brief update about our work. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, um, I'll make a few comments about that to give the listener a little bit of context for that. You saw that line that really didn't look much like an interference pattern. It just looked like noise, basically, with one spike in the middle, which was it's uh, where we expect the largest peak to be. But uh, as Farbad said, he was taking small amounts of data just basically to see that the system and, and, the, and the experiment was operating properly and he was getting data, et cetera. When he actually does this experiment, if you notice, there was about 60 points in that little graph that he showed is maybe 62 or something, but about 60 points. Each one of those points is taken when Farbod moves that detector one-tenth of one millimeter. Okay. Now, when we actually take data in order to get a good diffraction pattern, we're going to have to take that data for about four minutes, maybe as much as five minutes. So now imagine that you're Farbod and you have this set up and you set it up to your first point, okay? And you now take five minutes of data and then you move the detector one-tenth of one millimeter and then you take five minutes of data and then you move it one-tenth of one millimeter and take five minutes of data. And you do that for 60 points. So you can see that is basically you know, the process that he's going to have to go through. Now, he does have the tools such that he can move something one-tenth of one millimeter. You couldn't do that with an eyeball. Obviously, you need something that's calibrated that allows you to do that. 
And hopefully, we don't have it now, but that will be automated with a motor called a step motor, which will actually do that, that moving. But I don't think we have the step motor in place yet. Do we, uh, Farbad? No, I'll put that once we are more comfortable with our results, our data, yeah. I automate that. Yes, but for right now, uh, when Farbad does an experiment and makes this data, you know, you, you have an appreciation that this is going to take him some hours, you know, sitting there without anything changing and anything moving. And then once we see that we're actually getting the kind of data that we're expecting, which we haven't seen yet, then Barbad will automate it, get a step motor, and then we'll be able to, he'll be able to set it all up, start it, come back two or three hours later, and it will be done, and then maybe do another one. But uh, so that's where we are. We're getting close to the point where we're hoping to have good data and we can actually take measurements and do the experiments. So we're, we're getting close, but as yet, we haven't actually seen the data we're looking for. And Farbad happened to discover that one of the problems was a filter we were using. And we may discover other such things as we, as we go. So it's, I don't wanna say that, you know, any week now, you know, we'll have it because we don't know what, what issues may uncover themselves as we go here. But in any case, I will venture to say we're getting close, ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're getting close, kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel that we, we ought to have some good interference data, which will enable us to do the experiment um, not that long from now. How long, I don't know, a week, two weeks, a month, two months, I don't know, but with a little luck, it won't be as long as two months, but that'll take a little luck. You know, you will, we find things as we go. We, who knows what else we may have to re-engineer as we go other than just those filters, but we'll see. So I think that's very encouraging. Thank you, Farvad. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, Farvad and David yeah. for being here. Thank you for that uh, wonderful detailed presentation, yeah. Farvad, and for all your patient work. Yeah. David, did you have anything you wanted to add? Oh, I think uh, we, we you covered, uh, covered it all. Thank you, guys. Okay. Thank I you just all. want to add that we don't stop until we get the results. So Excellent. You know it takes. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah that's a good thing to add. Yeah, we will just go until we get it right. Yeah, however, <laughs> however long that takes. So patience, everyone, patience. Uh, we're, we're working on it. And we seem to be getting closer. At least we're a lot further along than we were last time we talked to you. So. Anyway, thank you, Donna, for thank coming you. and uh, you, for filming this for us. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Just if anybody asks, uh, because they may, or, or we can put it there and I can, we can always have people in the waiting list. So yeah. we start with, uh, we have some people from Caltech. So the idea is bring quantum and engineering together. That's the plan. Nice. So we have people from Caltech who are engineers. We have uh, from JPL who are mm -hmm. engineers. And then we have from other universities. So they are engineers, but they also work in optics. We have professor of physics who is uh, also uh, uh, is one of the leaders actually in this area of quantum and physics. We have from MIT, another professor in quantum. We have from Oxford, my colleague. And then from UCLA, uh, Professor uh, Galvez, who is always helping me actually, who, is, who, is, who helped me to understand about the filter. From National Institute of Standard, we have from Air Force and somebody from quantum computing report. So that's, and there are some information about the speakers and what they will be talking about. So Farbad mm -hmm. has put this together and organizing it and bringing that these people wonderful. together, engineering and physicists, so to yeah. discuss quantum and optical things and so on. So this, this little experiment we're doing now has actually caused some bigger things to take place in the science community.